Hey there, comic book friends. I'm Travis, and this is another edition of No Capes, where I talk about comic books that don't have to do with superheroes and or comic books that Ethan doesn't read along with me. At any rate, right off the bat, we're going to talk about creator-owned. This is an um, image title, and it is um, this issue has got two stories in it. Um, one story is written by Jimmy Pontolani and... Um, Justin Gray and has art by still Steve, uh, by um, I'm sorry Phil Noto and it's the Trigger um, Trigger Girl Six um, story and the other story is American Muscle and it is written by Steve uh, Niles with art by Kevin Millen and this is kind of a, what the cover of it would look like. Um, also in this 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 book is kind of a um, I don't know. It's like a it's like a comic book magazine of sorts. Uh, each one of these stories that's in here is about 12 pages long, and then there's probably another 20 pages in here that have um, the, there's an interview with Neil Gaiman in it uh, that that um, Jimmy Pinelli does. There is um, an article in here, a two page article in here on um, cosplay that these two um, um, girls they actually cosplay um, Trigger Six in it so there's an article on them you know asking them some questions about it yeah here here that is You're interested in that sort of thing um it also has um some other um writers and people in the industry talking about um create own work and what does that mean and and that sort of thing um and and each of the writers in here have their own a couple pages talking about their books and why they're why they're doing this and and, and stuff. Um, well, let's talk about the two stories in it. The first story that's in it is the um, American Muscle. Um, I think it entitled that because it's got um, muscle cars in it. Not that that's really what it's about. It's a post-apocalyptic kind of um, setting. Something bad has happened. There's disease. There's um, chaos in places. Uh, and stuff like that. Um, the characters in this are a group of young adults who are driving muscle cars. They've left some place that was some sort of safe place we get from the story, and they're traveling to potentially some new paradise kind of a place. They have some car problems along the way, um, but they get to their paradise, which is looks to be Hollywood, except, of course, like most of these kind of things, um, paradise isn't paradise. It's just as big a disaster as every place else is. Um, the interesting thing about this book, or the potentially interesting thing about this book, is it's written from the characters understand um, the post-apocalyptic world. It's like a lot of a lot of these types of books are written like like the characters have never thought about what would happen if a disaster happens or something like that. Um, and they're always caught flat-footed, and they're confused, and and, and all this stuff. Um, and and this is written from a perspective. These people have already seen all the movies that are out there. They've read the books. They all that stuff. And it's not that they're cynical. It's just that they're mentally more prepared, like me and you would be. You know, we've seen lots of this stuff and whatnot. Not that we wouldn't freak out if there were suddenly zombies or or other you know mutants or all the other kind of crazy stuff that goes on in that sort of sort of environment. But we have kind of a battle plan. We've all thought about it. We've all seen enough stuff that if you don't actually, you know, I'm not saying we have, you know, the crossbow sitting back there waiting to, you know, silently shoot zombies in the head. But it's crossed our mind. You know, we have a plan. If tomorrow suddenly there were a horde of zombies or whatever, it wouldn't take us long to gather up the tools or to quickly have a list of the tools we'd need to survive or to deal with it. And these people are kind of that way. It's, they're not... They're not caught flat-footed. Um, it's one of the things that I always kind of wonder about with um, The Walking Dead in the fact that you know, the people are scrambling like they're confused by the whole thing. I mean, yeah, you would be shocked, obviously. We'd all be shocked if there were suddenly zombies or something like that happened and whatnot. But I think we'd more quickly have the tools and the knowledge of what we think we need to do to deal with it than what it seems like maybe they do in that. Um, but... That, that's the first story in here. Um, it's entertaining. It has a kind of a cliffhanger and a crap moment at the end of it. Um, the artwork is okay. Um, 
it, it, it's it's it works for the setting. It's kind of a kind of a quick sketchy kind of a kind of a look to it, and it and it works for the grittiness of what's there. Um, the second story um, has this um, uh, Trigger Girl Six. Um, she's I don't know, um, genetically created, it seems to be, or something like that. Some sort of assassin that seems to know exactly what she's supposed to be doing and whatnot. Um, there's an interesting scene where she's basically dropped onto a airplane, flying airplane, um, to attack a senator or something like that. Um, we briefly see a president off screen saying, well, it's a trigger six, we have to get rid of this, you know, assassin. The senator's freaking out because, of course, to get rid of the assassin, they're going to shoot the whole place up. And she makes a mess of all of that whatnot. If you like um, uh, Phil Noto's art, which I do, um, it's a good story for that. You can look at some pretty pictures that he did. Um, if you're offended by nudity, you don't want this book because um, she starts out in a kind of a watery bubble. And, of course, when you genetically create somebody, they usually aren't genetically created with clothing. And they don't shy away from nudity, which doesn't surprise me with the writers that are involved. Um, but no, it's, it's an interesting story. I don't know if there's anything about it that makes it really unique so far. You know, it's a genetically created assassin. We don't know a lot about her, um, but she does a pretty efficient job, it seems. So I'll be curious to see where the story goes from here. Uh, I have a certain amount of faith in, um, in, in um, Jay Pavaloni and, and Justin Gray. I think that they... Um, usually write pretty strong stories and whatnot. I usually will uh, pick up whatever they've done to start out with just to see what it's like. That's why I got this thing. I personally am less interested in the stuff that in, it's in the back of it. I kind of like the idea, though, of a comic book magazine. Uh, the Neil Gammon article for um, interview that's in here, for instance, doesn't really tell me anything I don't know about Neil. Um, that's just because I like Neil Gammon, so I've you know, taken the time that. Uh, cosplay isn't necessarily my thing, but it's interesting to read about other people that are interested in that and whatnot. And I'm always interested in what the the scene is that's going on and the creator own stuff and whatnot. Um, uh, a, a, an interesting book. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm picking up issue two of it. I don't know that I'm super excited about it. I'm curious to see what it's going to be. You know, if it's continued to be this thick thing, um, it costs $3.99. Um, I'm not paying that much because I get it on discount. Um, to see what these stories are. They say that there's going to be room in here for other people to do stuff later on, so maybe they'll get other creators of other stuff. Um, but yeah, um, I, I, I like it. it. It's interesting. Like I said, in the top of it, it says two great stories, interviews, cosplay, and more. Um, it's interesting. It's interesting. I'm curious to see what all, um, what all, they, what all they put in it. Um, to see if it's a magazine type style type thing that I want to keep getting or, or not. Or if I want to stick with just getting, you know, pure comic books. I'm not sure how much of this I'm not getting off the internet. Well, what's in here, these articles and what people are talking about that I, I can't pick up off the internet from following creators and whatnot. Anyway, there's that. Next I'm going to talk about Saucer Country. This is um, issue four. Um, I've seen some of the quote unquote professional type reviews that really dogged this issue, um, saying that they don't really think the book is going anywhere, um, they're taking too long to really get to something. Um, I think they're wrong. This issue, um, I really liked. Um, it, it gives us, it, it sets the players even more. Uh, whereas we've been starting to get introduced to characters and whatnot, in this issue, we now really start to cement who the players are and where they're going to be at in the book. You know, what, what niche of this whole thing do they represent? Who, who are they working for or um, what are they representing and whatnot? The, you know, the, um, we found out that the, the ex-husband, um, you know, he's been going to um, regression therapy. That's kind of messed him up. Um, um, our, our mythology professor has kind of went, oh man, he knows the guy that does this regression stuff and, and the regressionist kind of puts his own spin on what he thinks is happening and so convinces the people that he's doing therapy with that they're convinced that. So the ex-puzzin's even more confused now as to what his thing is. There's 
the political spin that continues to go on this thing. The end of this has got an interesting, ooh, they're going to play some really interesting political type games because, of course, the ex-husband's talking to a therapist. The therapist is potentially spilling the beans that that the ex-husband of the potential presidential candidate is, um, you know, thinking that he's seeing aliens. There's a group there in... Um, in um, New Mexico that, that thinks that the government's hiding all of this stuff and they're going to use their political weight. Um, yeah, this just adds more players, adds more players and defines even further where they're at, how they're going to operate. What of this whole crazy story are they going to accept as being real, not real, or I don't care if it's real or not real. I just need to know how to figure out how to make my candidate win. Um, so... I'm really liking it. I mean, I, you know, this 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 um, issue wasn't like riveting. It didn't have any oh my crap moments in it. The end of it's really cool. The end of it sets up a, an interesting. Ooh, we're gonna be playing a, like I said, we're gonna be playing a cool political game. Um, I'm just really digging this. Th this isn't the strongest cover. I, I kind of like it. Um, the last cover with the rabbit on the front it was just horrifically cool. Um, but no, art's still really strong in this. Ryan Kelly just, I mean, man. It, it, for me, pick it up for that if nothing else, just because, like I, I continue to say, he draws characters very well that seem like characters. They seem like real people. They they have quirks. You know, they have they have feeling. You know, they're not just a four color thing there on the on the on the page. Um, so as I continue to say, if you like political thriller slash X Files West Wing ish kind of a thing. This is this is interesting. I like it. Um, if you don't want to pick up the singles, I bet you it's going to be great to read in trades when the tra when the trades start hitting. Um, but pick up the singles so my book that I really enjoy uh, keeps getting made. Okay. Anyway, definitely like that. Next, I'm going to talk about the massive. This is um, Brian Woods' new title. Um, since you know he dropped the DMZ, this is the next thing that. I guess fits within that genre to some degree and that it has to do with potentially real world kind of things, what if kind of stuff. Um, I like Brian Woods. I like this style of work. I think it's, it's interesting. Um, I really like this first issue. It wasn't really preachy. I, you know, I kind of worry, okay, it's going to be an environmental mag and we're going to go off on how bad everybody is and it's going to be really heavy-handed, Greenpeace, R Rainbow Warrior type thing. No, that's not the case. There are characters in this, in this that, you know, maybe are going to fit that bill to some degree. Um, but I really, I really liked it. I liked the artwork. Um, uh, Sleepy Reader was caught me on the fact that, that he wasn't real keen on the coloring in the book. Um, the color choices, the color palette they use. Um, isn't very appealing. Yeah, he's kind of right. Um, the, the setting of this, it's set out in the Arctic, so you got these cold gray colors um, for a lot of it. And um, when they're inside the cabin of the ship, everything has a really odd green hue to it. I think that's probably, they chose those colors for inside the cabin because maybe that's all the radar and, you know equipment they're using and whatnot that tends to have that kind of gray, stereotypical gray hue to it. So that's why it has that kind of color. Um, there are some interesting characters in here, I think. Um, I, I think I know a little bit more about some of these characters um, because in the past, um, um, Dark Horse Presents um, books, they've had little stories about these characters, um, about their past. So... I've seen the, the, one of the main characters in here is a um, mercenary who's now basically a pacifist. Um, we saw the event that happened that I think changes him to decide that he needs to do something different. Um, so I got a background on him. I have a background on um, um, the second mate who kind of wants to be the first mate potentially from Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka I think. Someplace like that, I can't remember now. But um, so I have a little more of his backstory. Um, but I don't know that you need that. I don't know that you needed that backstory to read this. Um, 
but I think it's going to be interesting. You know, the premise here, for those that don't know, is there's been an environmental, some environmental disaster happened. And I don't say some, a lot of different environmental disasters happened kind of all at once. Massive giant waves, most coastal cities and whatnot have been hit by tsunamis and are destroyed. That in turn caused a massive collapse in the economy. Um, large fisheries died off. Um, everything's just kind of spinning out of control in a bad way. There are lots of um, oil refineries, off, offshore oil refineries that are blowing up and it's just kind of a giant disaster everywhere. And this is basically a story about what happens when those environments, those, those Greenpeace, those Rainbow Warrior type dudes, what happens to them after all the stuff they were trying to save and all the stuff they were trying to do goes to hell in a handbasket? It, it, everything blew up. So, so now what? It, it's part of what this is. What's, what's their goals now? Also in this story, besides that, besides that overlying arc, there's also the other overlying arc is is they're looking for the massive. The massive is a um, their mother ship, their mother you know boat that is a converted factory ship that kind of can hold like 200 some people on it, but there's only 40 people on it, and it's lost at sea somewhere, and they're trying to find it so they can get to back together with their other people and whatnot. Um, so there's a mystery because they keep thinking they see it on their radar just out at the very edges of their radar, and as they move that direction to try and find it, it seems to disappear. About the time they go, gosh, we can't find it, then this kind of ghost of it shows up on their radar again, and they keep moving trying to find it. Um, I think there's going to be lots of action in this. There's some, there's some excitement and action in this one with some pirate-type people that they have to deal with and whatnot. There's going to be the whole environmental thing that's going to be in this. Oh, they're on a ship, so they don't have... I'm, I'm assuming they don't have... Um, fuel forever, so at some point they're going to have to try and find fuel. They don't have food forever, so at some point they're going to have to try and find food. All that kind of stuff. Our captain is a pacifist, but we're in, and, and the second mate is, is going, look, we're in a new world, and in this new world, you have to take charge. If you don't take charge, something bad's going to happen to us. So she is not so much a pacifist, nor is the second mate. The second mate was a mercenary along with our captain, um, and he hasn't really given up his militant type ways. So it's going to be really, I think it's going to be really interesting. Um, I agree with Sleepy Reader. The colors are gloomy, but I think that matches the book. Um, so there is, there is that. Um, interesting read. Um, I think it's going to be a read like DMZ and that it's um, going to have lots of things for you to think about while it's going on in it. And I think that Brian Woods Wood does a really good job of um, of presenting possible facts without being preachy, without it being too much of a, oh my gosh, you should go out and save all the sea turtles and the ocean and everything because this would be bad. Not, not that it wouldn't. Okay, that's it for comic books I have to talk right now. I'm going to talk about another book um, a couple days ago as of this recording. Um, was my birthday. Yay, happy birthday to me. And one of the things I got as a birthday present was this book. And this is Mail Order Mysteries. Um, real stuff from old comic book ads. Which, of course, for any of us that have either been reading comic books for a very long time, or you go back and you buy those Silver Age and old comic books, there's all those crazy ads for the X-ray vision, um, learning karate, being a muscle man, um, all that crazy, you know, sea monkeys, all those great crazy things in here. Well, this book is about all that crazy stuff. Most of the stuff that's in this book is from the um, late 60s through the 70s. Um, kind of the, the heyday of all of this type of stuff going on, even though they've been producing this stuff since, I don't know, the 40s or something like that, probably. And, and basically what the book is, is it takes each of these, the guy has... The guy that wrote it has basically spent time on eBay hunting all this stuff down, buying it for a bajillion dollars more than probably what it was worth at the time that they got it, and, and basically looking and seeing what it is. So each thing in here basically has a, uh, what was my expectation of what I thought I was going to get when I was a kid, what it was that we really got, how did it hold up to what the expectation was. And it's just been fun. I haven't really read all of it yet. I've just been kind of browsing through it. Um, it's got a great... 
it's got a great intro in it that that you know t to some degree you, you can uh, or they tell me to read the the very f first uh, uh, paragraph or so of the intro um, and it says here I was a first grader on a routine visit to the neighborhood gas mart when I was first confronted with a newly installed tower rack of comic books. In an instant, I was at the mercy of the colorful spinning column, overflowing with eye-punching artwork, tantalizing characters, and glimpses into unseen worlds. I had no choice but to forfeit my candy money for a copy of Micronauts No. 9. As I camped out in my bedroom carpet, thumbing through the baffling storyline, I found myself on the verge of buyer's remorse. I should have just played it safe with my usual fun dip and lick a stick. Then I turned to an uncrowded page of fascinating black and white drawings. I was captivated. It was an ink smudged window into an unfamiliar realm where gorilla masks peacefully lived among hovercrafts and ventriloquist dummies. It was the latest ad from the Johnson Smith Company, a novelty distributor that had been honing their catalog since 1914. A dozens of pages later, an outfit called the Fun Factory featured another full page of assortment, assortment of wonders. And elsewhere in the issue, I found a hundred toy soldiers for a buck, an offer for a free million dollar banknote, and an ad for something called Grit. Now, as a kid, I was never really a sucker for these things. I wasn't drawn into too many of them. I mean, some of them I would look at and laugh about and whatnot. But, but the hundred toy soldiers for a dollar, that one sounded cool to me. It always sounded cool to me, and I always wanted to buy into that one. But of course, you know, most of us, our parents said, heck no, we're not letting you do that. Um, I played with lots of toy soldiers as a kid, and the idea of for a dollar, you know, for the price of a couple candy bars, I could um, have a couple hundred soldiers. That sounded awesome to me. So anyway, so yeah, sure enough, you know, it's got the whole thing in here. It's got the ads for it. This one is your x-ray specs. You know, and just to give you an example here, we imagine glasses that enabled you to see real skeletons and nudity, right? You know, and then it tells you what they sent. The eyewear stuffed with, um, eyewear stuffed with bird feathers, really. The original Spectre Ray illusion occurs as the viewer looks through genuine feathers, which are embedded between cardboard layers of the lens. The feathers, veins, diffract light, creating the appearance of two offset images. A darker area forms where the image overlaps, which can be interpreted as the bones in your hand and the curves of a lady. Behind the mystery, the X-ray specs came out, came out about 1964 when Harold von Brunhunt, the mastermind behind Sea Monkeys, repackaged an optical effect made popular by a device called the Wonder Tube. The specs were so successful they spawned various iterations, like the underwater specs and a few other things. Customer satisfaction, not exactly what we expected, but, e but exalted as the, as the quintessential mail order novelty, of course, because that's the thing we all talk about, the, ex the spec rate. But I mean, there's just, I mean, there's tons of stuff. Hypno coin in here, um, vampire bat. You know, there's the ad for the vampire bat. <laughs> and there's the reality of what you got. Uh, vampire blood, genuine soil from Dracula's castle. There's the app. There's the app for it. Just all kinds of hilarious binoculars for bugs, binocular eyeglasses, just, you know, 10 in 1 coin, secret book safe, um, a air car hovercraft. Of course, there it is. In reality, it's not really a car. Um, but like I said, I'm looking forward to looking forward to looking at looking at this. I know somewhere in here is my the hundred soldiers for a buck. You find out that they're just kryptonite rocks. Yeah, we can all go mess with Superman now. War zone and split up into different. Like, yep, here it is. There it is. Hundred toy soldiers for a dollar. There's your toy soldier. <laughs> they're like almost paper thin plastic things that don't stand up because uh, they're flat they're flat I mean they're like not much thicker than I don't know a couple pages <laughs> anyway I just thought it was fun it, kind of a comic book kind of thing anyway uh, that's it for this time around uh, in a couple weeks I'll have some more of those no cape comics to talk about anyway have a good one guys bye